I cannot specifically remember exactly what grade I was in, but I do remember that I was in middle school. I remember this detail because when this event took place, I was with someone that was only my friend during my middle school years. After that, my friend moved away and we lost touch. And this story takes place on the outskirts of St. Louis, Missouri, during the 1980s. For reference to, we will call the friend that I was with, Amy. So it had been a fun day with Amy. My mum had dropped us off at the mall where we had been wandering around window shopping and trying on clothes and stuff. This was a very tiny mall in a small town on the outskirts of St. Louis. Because this mall was so tiny too, it didn't actually have a lot of restaurants or a food court or anything. However, there was a McDonald's across the way. To get there faster too, you could cut through a field that was in between the mall parking lot and a street. Once you cut across that field and cross the road, McDonald's was pretty much right there. So, Amy and I went to McDonald's, ordered our food and we sat down. We were eating our ice cream and just sort of chatting away when a man walked in and sat down at the table in front of ours. The way that we were sitting put Amy's back to him but left me facing his direction. And almost immediately I began to get a really uneasy feeling because not only did this man not order anything to eat but... He just sat there the entire time staring at me with the angriest look on his face. He wasn't even trying to hide it too, the fact that he was just staring. I also remember that he had these piercing eyes that were bright blue. But keep in mind too that this was before cell phones were abundant so calling my mum wasn't really an option. And being as young as I was it never really occurred to me in my childlike mind that I should maybe get the attention of an adult working there or ask to use the phone. All I could remember thinking was this scary man was making me feel really uncomfortable. But eventually Amy and I finished our food and our ice cream. I had used her head to obstruct the man's view of my face and whispered to her what he was doing. I also told her that if he followed us out that we needed to run. And sure enough, as soon as we got up to leave... So did he. We rushed out the door as fast as we could. Then we began to sprint. I looked behind me and he was getting into one of those boat-sized cars that were made in like the 70s or early 80s. Luckily for us, there wasn't much traffic and we were able to cross the street before he had a chance to even get to us. When we got to the field, I turned around to look to see where he was again. Before I go any further too, let me note that next to the field was the street that ran horizontally, the one that we had crossed, and then to the left of the field, there was another street that ran vertically. That street intersected with the one that we had to cross, so the field was basically in the corner of these streets, if you catch my drift. The street to the left didn't run in a perfectly straight line though, it ran in a sort of diagonal direction that would eventually take you to the mall parking lot. And this was good too because when I had turned around again I could see that he was actually watching to see where we were going. Next, he turned into the street to the left of us and was driving really fast. He was definitely coming for us. And like I said, the street that ran diagonally took him in the direction away from us but would eventually have us end up in the same parking lot. And it was very obvious that... He was trying to get to the mall parking lot before we could get there because the road that he was on went away from us and we were shortcutting it through the field plus running as fast as we could. But we were able to get inside of the mall thankfully before he could catch us but I think that we got very, very lucky. Once we got inside of the mall though, we frantically ran up to the security guard and told him what had happened. Shockingly enough too, he blew our story off as an exaggerated tale from two dramatic middle school children. Things were much different back then. Today, if young kids approached an adult with a story like that, the police would be called right away, I suppose, and a description of the man and his vehicle would be taken. Even worse than that, though, when Amy and I told my mother the story, she just blew it off as well. My mother was emotionally neglectful and definitely was not the best parent growing up. I had serious trust issues towards adults growing up because of many situations like this. I never felt protected by the people that should have listened and also kept me safe. I felt alone and unheard. This event being an important reason too that I felt that way, but anyway, 
I digress. So fast forward a few days ago and my husband was watching a YouTube video about serial killers. And I stopped dead in my tracks because as he was watching it, a familiar picture popped up on that video. One of the people or the pictures of the men mentioned in this video was the same man from that McDonald's. I am 99% certain that it was him too. And his name was Tommy Lynn Sells. Now, let me add too that I have an excellent memory and I'm definitely a visual learner. I suck at names but never forget faces. I can even remember a few people and events from when I was like only three years old. But this was such a scary event that I never forgot that man's face or the angry look that radiated off of him. It definitely stayed engraved in my young mind and there is no doubt in my mind that that man was evil. My husband already knew my story and when I told him that I thought that that was the man who attempted to kidnap me, he was a bit skeptical at first. So together we decided to do a little further research on this guy. And what came next only solidified what I suspected. Tommy Lynn Sells was killing people, sometimes young girls my age, and he was indeed killing people in the St. Louis area during that time. He was also working at carnivals and was traveling, killing other people in other states. Like most serial killers though, he didn't have a, a type. Anyone he could get his hands on was pretty much fair game. He just liked the rush of killing. But what made this even creepier was the mall that Amy and I were at had a carnival going on every summer in the parking lot on the other side of where we were. I can't really remember what month it was when this happened, but I do remember the weather was really hot. Which means that I'm relatively positive that it was summertime. I wonder too if maybe he was working for that carnival? The picture of him on Wikipedia is exactly what the man at McDonald's looked like, that's for sure. Even down to the same evil angry look. And I for one will never forget that expression. Now, I've been mulling over and over this ever since. I don't know if I should contact the FBI with my story. Although he was executed in 2014. L.E. knows of 22 murders that he committed, but they suspect that there are many, many more. And who knows, but my story might just place him in an area someone disappeared from, but I don't know how helpful it would actually be considering that I can't remember the exact month or year. And to be honest, I don't even know if I would be believed. What do you guys think I should do? This took place 20 years ago when I was 12 years old. Almost all of the details were kept from me at the time, I think due to my age, so I didn't find out until much later what actually took place. But my mother, understandably, still doesn't really like talking about any of this, as it was a really traumatic experience. It's only with hindsight that I've realized how genuinely creepy and horrific this whole situation was. Anyway... In early 2000, I had just started high school. We lived a little ways away from school, so my mother used to drop me off in the mornings and pick me up in the afternoons. On the 15th of February that year, I headed to meet my mum at the usual pickup point across the road from my school, but I was surprised to find my grandmother waiting for me there instead. My grandmother told me that my mum wasn't able to pick me up, so I went with her and we picked up my brother from his primary school. But my sisters were both away on school trips. We went back to my grandparents' house and my nana and my grandfather sat us down to tell us that something terrible had happened. That our mum's close friend, Vivian, had died the previous day. They didn't go into any details other than that mum was obviously extremely upset. We were upset too, to be honest. I mean, Vivian was a lovely lady and we had spent a lot of time at her house over the years... Not only because Vivian and my mum were close, but also because Vivian's husband, Andrew, was my brother's club scout leader, and one of their sons was my brother's friend. At that age, though, nobody that I knew had ever really died, so 
It was quite difficult to process what had happened. We'd only just seen her the previous weekend, in fact. From my perspective as a naive 12-year-old, the following days passed mostly without incident, apart from my mother's obvious sadness. In hindsight, there was also an air of disquiet around her, but I didn't really clock it at the time. Around two weeks after Vivian's death, I was at home with my mother and my brother while my stepfather, a barista, was out for dinner with a client. It was early evening, maybe like 7pm, and I believe my older sister was at her boyfriend's house while my younger sister was at basketball practice. Our house has a large open plan L-shaped room which encompassed the kitchen, living room and the dining room areas. My brother was playing in his bedroom while I was sitting on the couch just watching TV in the living room area with my mum. From that vantage point too I had a clear view of the front door but the security light on our front porch flickered on and there was a knock at my door. My mother got up to answer it and as she opened the door she took a step backwards and visibly stiffened. Vivian's husband, Andrew, was standing on our porch asking to see my stepfather. I remember my mum explaining that my stepdad wasn't available to talk at the moment and that if Andrew needed to speak to him then it would be better to leave a message. Andrew clearly realised that my stepdad wasn't home and insisted on waiting for him. My mum repeated that it would be better to call another time but he easily sidestepped her into the house and strode straight into the living room area. I can still picture my mother's forced cheeriness and frozen smile as he sat down on the couch opposite mine and asked for a cup of tea while he waited. Mum, still with that strange smile plastered on her face, asked me to make tea while she told V's husband that she'd call to find out what time my stepdad would be home. I made tea for all three of us and... I sat back down on the couch, making awkward small talk with him while my mum repeatedly dialed my stepdad's mobile number, but he wasn't answering. Andrew was talking to me, but I remember thinking that it was rude that he didn't seem to be paying any attention to what I was saying. His eyes were constantly flickering over to my mum, who was standing at the phone in the kitchen area around five metres away from us. The whole thing just felt very weird to me at the time. But she eventually got through to my stepdad and, still smiling, said something along the lines of, Oh darling, Andrew is here. Yes, here, in the living room. Yes, yes, he said that he's waiting for you. You won't be long, will you? My stepdad was home within like 20 minutes and convinced Andrew to leave with promises that they would speak on the phone the following day. Now... I found out years later that my mother, stepfather and the rest of their friends, along with Vivian's parents and brothers, all strongly suspected that Andrew had actually murdered Vivian. But my siblings and I didn't attend the funeral. My mum felt that we were too young, I think anyway, but I later discovered that a police presence was needed at Vivian's funeral, which Andrew attended, because Vivian's brothers was so angry that there were concerns that they may assault Andrew as they were convinced that he had actually murdered her. That's how intensely people suspected him. Obviously, my mum was utterly terrified when he showed up at our door that night, but had been desperately trying to both not to antagonize him nor to frighten me. It had actually transpired that he had been interviewed by the police earlier that day, and it was clear that they were building a case against him. He wanted legal advice and potential representation from my stepfather, who in the end refused. Now, according to my mom, Vivian and Andrew had been having marital problems for a long time, and Vivian had confided in my mom and others that she had felt increasingly uncomfortable around him, and that his temper could be frightening for both her and their children. They were already sleeping in separate bedrooms, but... He didn't seem to be accepting that the marriage was all but over. The previous weekend, she had told my mum and others that she was planning to officially leave him and that she was going to be making it clear to him that it was over too. She was bludgeoned to death with a steel rod in her bedroom on Valentine's Day when she returned home from dropping her boys off at school, having supposedly interrupted a burglary. Though... The police immediately realized that it was obviously staged. 
The contents of drawers from the bedside tables and the chest of drawers had been emptied out in piles onto the floor, but there was no indication that these piles had been sifted through. There were no signs of forced entry and nothing was stolen. My mom, and others for that matter, believed that she had potentially rejected some form of romantic gesture and he'd snapped. However, there was blood on the piles of drawer contents, but no blood on the floor underneath, which suggests that the burglary may have been staged before she even returned home that morning. Andrew tried to cover up his crime by deliberately driving to a series of shops and obtaining receipts for small purchases and making inquiries with cashiers to build an alibi. He also originally claimed that he had visited a large shopping mall on the day of the murder and walked around there for quite some time. But two weeks later, presumably when he realized that the police could check CCTV and find that he wasn't there, he changed his story and said that He'd actually been at a very popular local nature reserve walking and reading a book. Conveniently, there is no CCTV in any part of that particular nature reserve, including the car park. But he was not seen by any other walkers in the area that day. He had actually come to our house that evening after admitting earlier that day that he had initially lied about his whereabouts to the police. And he was arrested soon after. Andrew has never admitted to the murder, but was found guilty on circumstantial evidence. He was sentenced to 21 years with a minimum term of 16 years, meaning that he may already be out on parole. I can't find any information about that online, however, and I don't want to ask my mum about it, as I don't want to drag up awful memories for her. Oh, and uh, a few years later... Andrew also went through a phase of writing letters to my younger brother, who would have been around 11 or 12 years old at that stage, from prison, protesting his innocence. And that gives me the creeps. So last Friday, I was home alone, and at around 11pm I was watching some YouTube videos or something up in my room when... I heard a knock at my door. I knew nobody was supposed to be over, so I just ignored it. But they then started ringing on my doorbell, so I got up and I went to the front door. Now, there's usually a light at my front door that's on, but it seemed to be burned out all of a sudden. But even in the dim of the light, I could see that it was two kids who looked no older than eight. I opened the first door and I asked the kids what they're doing and... It was a boy and a girl. The girl asked, may we come in and use your phone? We got lost and we can't find our way back home. And I mean, it was two kids, so I think anyone would say yes, right? But something just felt wrong and I couldn't figure out what it was. And I still don't know why I didn't let them in. But the light at the front porch then flickered on for maybe a second or two. And when I looked at the kids... I could see that their eyes were completely pitch black. I took a step back and I slammed the door shut, locking it. And they kept banging on the door for maybe five minutes and it sounded like the door was about to fly off the hinges any second, but then all of a sudden it just stopped. I looked out of the house windows, but I couldn't see anyone and I think that they must have left. I didn't get any sleep that night, and to be honest, I've been struggling to sleep ever since then. So my daughter, two years old when this started, talks about seeing things in the mirror in her room. At first, we figured that it was just make-believe, but then it got a, a little more weird. I'll, uh share some of the details below, but my question for you is, what's the best way to deal with this? So one day, she was in her crib, which is right by a wall that is mostly mirror, two mirror doors and a sliding closet. She pointed at the mirror and she asked me, do you see the doggy daddy? I was confused. I asked her if she meant her stuffed dog, one of the few different stuffed animals, but it was not currently in sight. She insisted 
No, in the mirror. It kept pointing as though a dog was sitting right by the mirror, or inside of it. At the time, we used to turn on red lights as a nightlight for her, and she said, he likes the red lights. And in her garbled way, she also said, he comes and sits when you go away. Now, we read to her a lot, but she doesn't watch much in terms of videos or TV. She speaks well for her age, but she doesn't generally make up stories. And I'll admit that I was a little spooked, but she didn't seem to be afraid, so we just put her to bed like normal, and we just went about our night. I did mention it to my wife, but again, we just didn't think too much of it. About an hour after she fell asleep, though, she woke up absolutely screaming. Pretty unusual for her. Not just crying, too, but screaming and really distressed. She seemed to be saying no, no, no as well. We watched in the monitor for a bit, wondering if we should go in, and then my wife gasped and my heart skipped a beat because we actually saw something. It looked like two white lights chasing each other through the air. My wife later said that she thought that somebody was in the room because she saw a foot. We bolted in there though, obviously, and we turned on the lights. My daughter was crying uncontrollably, and when she calmed down, she wouldn't say anything, but she did look traumatized. Just sort of staring at the wall, maybe. We moved her crib into our room for the night and felt really disturbed by the whole thing. I've thought about it a lot, and I can't figure out how those lights could have appeared in the room the way they did. We've seen dust floating and glowing, but this, this was a lot different. The next day I asked her about it and she said that it was a wolf. I have no idea where she got the idea of a wolf from. There's nothing like that in the books that we read to her. But then she said the little one was there and the big wolf came and they fought. She had never said anything like this before, especially about fighting. But in the end we couldn't really get anything else out of her about it. She just never brought it up again. However, she has mentioned a few times that there is a man in the mirror. She said that he talks to me a lot. She also often insists on showing things to the mirror. For instance, once we put her in a new dress and she said, I have to show the mirror. So I held her up in the bathroom mirror, but she insisted this mirror wasn't the one that she wanted. She wanted to show the mirror in her room. Once she found a little ornament of a dog and said, I show this to the mirror and ran into the room. And she came right back out and said, no dogs. The mirror says no dogs. Last night she was calling to us after we put her down and asking us to protect her. Just casually sing-saying without fear, mommy, daddy, protect me. So we came in and asked what she meant and she said, there's a lion and pointed to the mirror. So we sort of played along and shoot it away, which made her smile and get back into bed. It was now a toddler bed. She'd been in there for a few weeks too. I was a bit on edge because of the dog thing in the past being a precursor to weirdness. But anyhow, I'm up working. Wife goes to bed. An hour later, I hear a thump and my daughter starts crying loudly. I rush in and she had fallen out of her bed. I'll happily admit that maybe it was just a coincidence, but she's never fallen out before. Today I asked her too if we should cover the mirror up with a curtain or something and she actually said yes, that it's scary sometimes. She said that she saw a monster once but then she said we can open the curtain sometimes to say hello. I asked her who we would say hello to and she said Mr. Wolf. She doesn't seem to be scared of Mr. Wolf but she also said that he's not nice. Anyway, obviously I have no idea what to make of any of this really, but I sure would appreciate if somebody could point out to me some resources or something to approach the subject with, because this whole situation is strange to say the least. This was back in November of 2018 and takes place in North Carolina. I was 14 at the time. 
My family and I had just moved across states. We just gotten into the city where we planned on living after a long road trip. We were all hungry so decided to go to grab some dinner before we went back up to pick up the keys to our new house. We went to this local pizza shop and since we had our dogs with us because we hadn't moved into our house yet, we decided to eat in the car. I'm a pretty fast eater compared to the rest of my family anyway so I finished way before they did. After I was done I decided to bring my puppy out to do a business. We were just standing there a little ways up from the car playing in the leaves on the ground. I actually grew up in Florida so I wasn't used to seeing piles of autumn leaves like that. So I was just living my best life not paying attention to my surroundings when a man all of a sudden taps me on the shoulder. My dog notices him and immediately tries to jump on him as she does with anyone. So I pull her back while I'm backing away from him. He looks to be in his mid 40s, 50s maybe. He smiles creepily at me like it was forced. He says in this scruffy southern voice, you have my dog, my border collie. Immediately, a red flag goes off in my mind as my dog looks very obviously like a boxer, nothing like a border collie. Now, let me tell you too that I am horrible at confrontation, so I just say nervously, uh, I think you're mistaken sir, uh, this is my dog not even telling him that my dog does not look anything like what he was describing. I look over to my parents' car that was just a couple of feet away, unsure of what to do next. They hadn't even noticed the man approach me and they were, I think, on their phones. The man now asks me, well, would you be able to come and help me look for my dog? I can feel my stomach drop in that moment. I still didn't want to cause a scene though as I'm probably just overreacting but I have read my fair share of kidnapping and sex trafficking horror stories so I have an idea in the back of my mind on what's going to go down. He then says something along the lines of I have some money in my truck for you if I went with him that was. My hands are sweating at this point because this is something straight out of a reddit thread. He points over to a very sketchy, rundown looking truck. I tell him that I'm busy and might have to go, but best of luck with finding the dog, right? I was still trying to keep him on my good side, but looking back on it now, I don't know why I didn't tell him my parents were right there. If I would have, I think he may have backed off. I overly worry about what others might think, so I was just trying to be polite, I think, and not make him mad. But out of nowhere, he then decides to grab my dog's leash and say that he had dog treats at his truck and starts to walk away with my dog. I pull the leash away from him and say sternly, I have to go now. As I start walking away, he then grabs my wrist and rips the leash out of my hands, throwing it to the ground. He starts pulling me in with him, mumbling something like, just come and see what I have for you. My dog, the sweet good girl that she is, follows after us and starts barking. While he starts to drag me with him, I am pretty small, 5'4", and have no upper body strength. So, I just start screaming to let go of me. My parents, alarmed hearing me scream and our dog chasing after me barking, see this man pulling their daughter against her will, and they immediately start sprinting after me. I start screaming, Mom and Dad! And I think that he got alarmed when he heard me yell out Mom, as she starts running towards us. The sudden realization that my parents were right there in their car the whole time, he makes a run for it and we didn't run after him. My parents were just glad that they had me. This is definitely not a good way to start off your new life in North Carolina, right? Not even having lived there for a day yet. I don't wish this to ever happen to anyone as it was honestly terrifying. But my advice for you is this. But don't ever be afraid to use your words, even if they offend the person, because right there and then is not the time to worry about what others might think. So, the only word that I can really use to describe it is thing. It was and still is the creepiest thing that I've ever encountered in real life. I've always thought that the book series Goosebumps was genius because any time I get actually genuinely scared, I get goosebumps. And remembering the night that I saw it, 
something I really don't like to do often is just giving me these goosebumps again. Anyway, my childhood home was a house at the tip of a cul-de-sac at the end of a winding neighborhood road. It was a really nice place to grow up as there were footpaths snaking through the woods all around the development, allowing my friends and I to venture through the neighborhood as we pleased. The paths were especially useful to me as well as they connected right from the back of my house all the way to the bus stop at the beginning of the neighborhood and just a brief walk through the woods away. Since I grew up taking this path to and from school and since I got home late due to extracurriculars a lot, I grew accustomed to walking in the woods at night. But those were my woods and I wasn't really scared. I smoked with my buddies in these woods too and had times with some girls there as well and it was kind of like an extension of my backyard. But now, I won't ever, and I mean ever, go back in there again. I'm not really scared of much, and mind you, I was completely sober and rested during this story. It's rare for me to get scared, but it's a detail that I specifically remember. But anyway, enough exposition. Here's what actually happened. So I was coming home from an especially late night working on our school's competition robot, FRC, and taking my normal path home. And since I was a freshman and I lived a three minute drive from my school, I could walk home by using the community paths, crossing into my neighborhood and then using my path to get to my backyard. Normally I listened to music, but I had stupidly left my earbuds at the workshop after the doors locked, so I was walking to the soundtrack of chirping crickets and cicadas. It was an especially noisy night as well, with wind blowing that created a shallow whistling tone of sorts. It wasn't bothering me though, and I was making good headway into the night. Around the point when the poorly lit community path bisects with my street is where it started to get just strange. So my entire street has lights, evenly spaced about a thousand feet apart. They are always on with multiple backups in place, and I've never seen them even once so much as flicker. And well, when I got to the end of the community path, I began to look both ways to cross the street... My neighborhood's entrance is a long downward slope that bottoms out to a bridge above a little creek and begins to slightly ascend around a curve and out of sight. The path that I needed to get to was past this bridge and to the left of the edge of the woods. As I finished checking both ways and was about to step into the street, I saw a silhouette standing under the light at the very bottom of the slope. And it seemed to be just completely still, like a statue of a shadow or something. And as I begin to get a bit more detail, the light right above it just went out. This alone really freaked me out and I was immediately paralyzed, standing at the top of the street looking down into the impossibly dark void that just swallowed the light source in my path, with goosebumps shooting along my taut skin. I considered walking through, but as that thought crossed my mind... So did the one wondering about what the ever-loving shit was both under and controlling that light. I then thought that maybe it was a maintenance worker just messing with me. Either way, when the second light, the one that was closer to me, went out, I didn't care what it was. I was not happy. I took a moment to collect myself though and to reassure myself that I wasn't in some sort of a fantasy world. There's no such thing as Wendigos or aliens or some crazy stuff coming for me like that. So I took a deep breath and I crossed the street. I got across and I slowed a bit when exiting the safety of the street light, still on. When my spider senses were just going absolutely berserk as I walked into that Vanta black space. I was so relieved when I got to the fourth working light which was at the beginning of my path and as I began to walk that path, something just inside of me told me to not turn around and to just simply run. And stupidly, I didn't listen. I turned back to the light that I had just crossed and in the middle of the globe was just an incredibly unnerving sight. It was hunched and it was a hooded figure, seemingly seven feet tall and with this impossibly thin frame standing on four legs and if I wasn't scared before now I was petrified I swear to you that I thought death itself was coming for me 
but another second of contemplating was all it took for me to see it move slightly in my direction, and my decision to begin a full tilt sprint to my house was now made. But the scariest part of this entire story was probably not the fact that I couldn't tell who or what this thing was, but it was the fact that as I began to run home, I could definitely hear something running after me. I've never cried so hard in my life running down that path in that night. And with each step that I took, I heard a subsequent two thumps of weight pushing aside the rocks that lined the path behind me. I was hysterical, going insane, too afraid to look back, just running faster than I've ever run before. As I turned the final curve in the path, I heard the frequency of the steps behind me slow, and as I hopped the deck and ripped open the side door, flinging myself inside and locking the door, I looked outside the glass panes that saw back out onto the path, and in the night, just barely illuminated by the moon, that thing was just staring right back at me. The only way I can describe this thing too is like, someone took a photo and cut out a silhouette of the monster from the village or something, and just way bigger than that, and put it right in front of me. I couldn't even move a millimeter once I got inside because I was just completely frozen on the spot. But after multiple minutes of me staring at it unblinkingly, it turned and just began to slowly, nonchalantly, walk away. As it trotted out of view, I ran to every entrance of my house, locking everything, and I ran to my room where I subsequently broke down for a good three hours before exhausting myself and eventually just falling asleep. My parents were too freaked out by my experience and incoherent rambling to believe me, so they waved it off as just a sleep-deprived paranoia thing or something. I was pretty mad at them for a while about that, I'll admit. And they always asked me why I stopped using that trail, and every time that I told them, they just laughed at me. But to me, it obviously just wasn't funny at all. You can believe me or not, but... This is one of the most vivid memories I have. I just wish that I could project this mental image too. If eyes could take pictures, I know that all of you would be just as scared as I was that night. My dad told me about this incident that happened in the early 50s when he was a young child. I'm sharing it here with how it was related to me. So, it was in the early 50s. My dad couldn't have been much older than 5 or 6 years old when it happened. He grew up on a large family farm that was fairly isolated. The nearest neighborhood was at least a quarter mile away through rolling wooded hills. There was no electric service on the farm back then and they didn't get phones until the summer of 1984 so they were effectively on their own. One day, Grandpa had sent my uncle to the feed mill to collect payment for that year's harvest. He was told to get it in cash. Grandpa wanted to pay that year's taxes and then deposit the rest in the bank. My uncle brought the money home and that night at around 2am they were awakened by a car parked on the property with its headlights aimed at the house. Grandpa rolled out of bed and crawled along the floor to my uncle and dad's bedroom and woke my uncle up. In almost complete darkness they ran down the stairs. My uncle ran out the back door and grandpa ran out of the front. Grandpa threw the front door open and ran outside so fast that he pretty much leapt over the back steps and went to confront the guy. The driver of the car was already most of the way to the house. He saw Grandpa coming with my uncle close behind and he turned and hauled us. And Grandpa wasn't far behind. He made it to his car and he was trying to drive away and Grandpa was grabbing the steering wheel trying to stop him. But eventually he managed to break loose and Grandpa chased him a short distance down the road but... He finally got away. At that point, Grandpa and my uncle noticed a second car at the end of the block speeding away as well. The intruders had managed to get away that night, but thankfully no one was hurt. The next day, Grandpa and my uncle reported what had happened to the sheriff, and the sheriff pretty much succinctly told them to buy some rifles, because if it happens again, do what you have to do to defend yourselves. And the next stop they made was to the hardware store to buy said rifles. One for each of my uncles and one for my grandpa. There was never a repeat of the incident as far as my dad knows. And the late night visitors were never caught.
This happened a few years ago when I was still living with my mum and I had borrowed a car to go see my boyfriend for the evening. It was around midnight when I got back to my neighbourhood so the roads were pretty much empty and that's when I noticed this dirty, run-down, rusted white utility van that a maintenance guy would drive following me. I never saw the driver's face but I got this immediate sinking feeling in my stomach because something just felt wrong about this van. Now, I was only 20 at the time, but I knew better than to just drive straight to my house and letting this person know exactly where I live, no matter how desperately I wanted to just go home and ignore it. But I also wasn't 100% sure that they were actually following me yet. I didn't want to jump to conclusions just because it was late and I was alone and being paranoid and all that. So I drove to a shopping complex a few minutes out of the way that's well lit and has a public library to see if I was followed there. I thought that I lost the van but decided to wait in the parking lot for a few minutes because I just had a bad feeling that I just couldn't shake. Sure enough, the van showed up and was driving in just random circles around the parking lot looking for me by the looks of things. That scared me quite a bit, so I drove towards the big mall here that's always got security or police presence because it was the midway point between where I was and where I lived. I parked in a very well lit, although empty, 24 hour McDonald's parking lot where I had a great view of the roads and the mall but I wasn't super easy to spot as well and I just waited to see if the van showed up looking for me. And it did. And of course, this would be the one time security and the cops were nowhere to be found, which was half the reason I decided to head there in the first place. Realizing that whoever was driving this van was 100% actively following me in the middle of the night, I knew that driving home was not an option, and that's a terrifying realization. Luckily, the police station is just a few minutes away from where I was, so I try and discreetly drive away, hoping the van hasn't noticed me yet. I wasn't that lucky because it wasn't long before the van was back in my rearview mirror. At this point, I'm panicking pretty hard and my anxiety is really high. I finally pulled into the police station parking lot and seconds later, the van came to a stop in the middle of the road for no more than a few seconds. I'm guessing just long enough for them to realize where I led them, and they just took off immediately, pretty quickly as well. I did make it home safe and without seeing the van again not long after, but this whole ordeal took up at least an hour of my night. It was after 1am by the time that I made it home, and I was pretty much terrified the whole night. I don't know what this guy's specific intention was, but honestly, I don't need to know. I know that it was nothing good and that I likely avoided a very bad situation. If you think that someone is following you, it's not stupid or paranoid to make sure that you aren't right, because who knows what might have happened if I had led them to my house or gotten out of my car. So me and my friend Jacob go out biking in a forest near my house because it's pretty big and it has some nice trails. We'd been biking around for, uh, I'd say about an hour when we realized that we were actually kind of lost. So we stopped to try and figure out where we were at. He was trying the map app on his phone when I noticed a house not too far off the trail. My friend's phone wasn't having any luck with connecting, so we decided to walk over to the house to check if someone could point us in the right direction. We knocked on the door, and honestly, just like a horror movie, and I know that's cliche, but this is exactly what happened. The door just creaked open by itself. Well, we walked in asking if anyone was there, and then we realized that the place was empty. It was mostly furnished, but... It looked pretty old and the fridge was rancid. My friend finds a staircase leading up to a floor and we decided to go up and check that part of the place out. The second that I put my foot on that staircase, I felt just nauseous. I almost fell over because of just how bad I felt in fact and my friend helps me make it out of the place but I collapse outside on the ground and I start vomiting just violently. My friend is trying to help me from falling into my vomit and once I was done I sat back up and I just tried to get some air. And that was when my friend turned around and just mumbled, 
Holy crap, dude. I turned around at this and the entire house was gone. Like, there wasn't even dirt and stuff that proved the house even existed. I mean, it looked like the house was never even there in the first place. There was even a tree growing in a spot where the corner of the place was. I didn't know what to say, so I just sat there just staring at the ground. And that was when I realized that I'd taken a picture of the place on my phone, so I pulled that out trying to see if I'd actually taken a picture or not. And it was just a picture of the ground just covered in dead leaves and grass. We decided that moving was better than staying there, and after probably half an hour or so, we found our way back to the trails that we knew. I've got no idea what the hell that was, but I'm wondering, has anyone else seen anything like this? I can't be the only one, right? If you guys have had any similar experiences or know of any similar stories, I would love to hear them, so please let me know in the comments section below. Oh, and uh, I actually returned there not too long ago trying to get some pictures for you guys, but after what happened when we tried going back to find the spot, I honestly just don't think that it's worth the risk anymore. This is because we went into the forest at uh, maybe 11 or 11.20ish a.m. We looked about for what could have only been about two hours tops and we left because we were starting to get hungry. He turns on his car and uh, we both immediately noticed that the time read 5 p.m. Which means that we were in there for roughly six hours and yet we barely felt it. So since then, me and my friend have pretty much agreed to forget it ever happened in the first place and just steer clear of that forest entirely. At age 14, my parents sent me to a military school in Virginia for pretty much bad behavior. Cadets stayed at the school throughout the school year except for a few weekends and holiday leaves and whatnot. The school opened in 1898, and many buildings on the campus have been around for well over a hundred years, like the barracks that I slept in, though several buildings throughout the years had burned down, like one such occurrence when an accidental fire burnt down the Delta Company barracks in 1924. But the academic building was built around 1915. It was two stories tall, with the second floor being full of classrooms. But my experience took place on the first floor, which featured a handful of offices for facility offices, a computer lab as well, and a large room that had two large swinging doors that opened into a study hall meant to accommodate roughly 75 students at any given time. But one aspect of my new life as a cadet was called guard duty, and every day, three cadets were randomly selected to be on guard duty. The guards had to wake up an hour earlier than everyone else at 5am and you'd wake up, get dressed in uniform and meet the other two guards at the academic hall. But once the guards got to the building, they were supposed to do a walkthrough on both floors to make sure nothing was out of place and check that nobody was inside. After the walkthrough, you'd sit by the phone in the first floor hallway and take calls from anyone happening to call in. So I had been at the boarding school for a few months when I was assigned my first guard duty. So the next morning, I woke up early and I got dressed as quietly as possible to avoid waking my roommate. It was pouring outside, so I put on my rain jacket on top of my uniform and walked through the dark to the academic building. Usually guards would meet up outside the building, but since it was raining hard, I just decided to go inside by myself. I waited inside the dark building for the other guards to show up, and after about 10 minutes, I started to get worried because they still had not shown up, and I was concerned that a facility officer might come early and see that I had not done my job. So I walked up the stairs and checked every classroom, and also the creepy bathroom that looked like it hadn't been updated since the 1940s, and nothing was out of place. So I made my way downstairs to check the offices, the study hall, and other rooms, I thoroughly opened every door and walked through every room. Once again, nothing was out of place and no one was inside. In fact, everything seemed pretty much in order in the dark building. And so I sat down in the hallway next to the phone. But after a few minutes, I felt the weirdest sensation. The building had begun to kind of shake softly. I could feel the vibrations in my body and see the small table next to me shake ever so much. I sat there completely frightened by whatever was occurring in front of my eyes. 
But the rumbling abruptly stopped a few moments later and I took a big sigh of relief. But then I started hearing noises from the study hall room. The doors to which were only 10 feet away from me. It started off just barely legible and I couldn't tell what I was hearing from that room. Though it seemed like it was getting louder and soon I started to hear what sounded like whispering. It kept getting louder and louder until I could hear what sounded like dozens and dozens of voices inside the room. And after a few moments I could actually hear what they were saying. But it was as if many conversations were taking place all at once in a kind of chaotic sense and I could hear laughter and comments like pass me the answers to the math homework and stuff like that. This was a room that I'd just been in a short while ago and there was no other entrance into it other than the swinging doors that I was sitting right next to. It had been completely empty short of all the desks and other items throughout the room but now I was hearing what I can only describe as a room full of voices. I sat there paralyzed with fear while hearing all of this and then I began to also hear a tapping noise coming from around the room. It sounded almost as if someone was hitting a ruler against a desk. The tapping sound began to move around the room while all the other voices continued. When suddenly the tapping stopped. But what was so much worse was that I heard something scream, sit down and shut up, it's study time. It was incredibly loud and unmistakably like an instructor was in there screaming at a, a room full of cadets. As soon as whoever or whatever finished screaming... The study hall fell completely silent. I sat in my chair wanting to bolt out of the building, but I was honestly just too scared to move. Plus, I'd have to pass by the doorway to the study hall to actually get out of the building. But my heart was pounding in my chest and I was breathing incredibly hard. I was terrified that whatever was in that room would realize that I was there. And then the building softly began to shake again almost as if whatever was taking place was coming to an end. A few minutes passed as I sat there in my chair in silence. I couldn't hear anything anymore coming from the study hall, and I began to feel slightly better about the circumstances, though I still had not built up the nerve to actually make a run for it yet. But then, the building started to shake again, and I could hear the ruler tapping noise start up again in the room. And this time, it was clear that... It was making its way to the door that led to me. It was moving fast and growing louder. It had almost gotten to the swinging doors when I sprang up without thinking and my survival instincts kicked in and I sprinted out of the building as fast as I had ever run before. Now, outside, I made my way through the dark back to my barracks and just as I was getting near the barracks, one of the guards was sleepily walking out of the barracks and the other students were all still fast asleep. I calmed my nerves and... I walked up to him. He hadn't seen me running in the rain yet, and for some reason I didn't tell him what I had experienced. I walked with him back to the academic building as he explained how he had overslept, and we walked inside. He made a beeline to the study hall room, opened the swinging doors, walked in, and tossed his backpack onto his assigned desk. I followed him inside, apprehensively, and when I got in, the room was still empty. So, to start off, this is a collection of stories from my old house that I lived in my entire life, up until three years ago. There was a lot that happened to me and my family in the house, but these are the ones that I could think of off the top of my head. So, before I begin, let me explain how my bedroom is set up and give some backstory on my family. My parents used to be paranormal investigators and were a part of a ghost hunting team in Arizona. They had many cases, but actually stopped when they dealt with something so bad that it really messed them up. And so, the paranormal really isn't anything new to us. Growing up, I believed in ghosts because of what I'd seen and learned, but now that I'm an adult, I'm sort of skeptical about everything, though I have had a lot of stuff happen to me that I really can't explain logically. So yeah, this is one of those stories. To explain my house, my bedroom was upstairs, attached to my bedroom was a Jack and Jill bathroom, connected to my sister's bedroom, both doors locked from inside of the bathroom, and one night my younger sister and I were sitting in my bedroom, 
I had a bunk bed set up so that the bottom was a desk and I would sleep at the top. At this time I was on the top bunk just playing on my phone and my little sister was at the desk drawing. At some point though we started to hear the bathroom doorknob move as if someone was trying to open it but we couldn't because it was locked. I told my little sister to go and open it because whoever was on the other side was stupid because it locks from that side. She goes over and tells me that the door is locked and before she got over to the door it just stopped moving. We just kind of shrugged it off thinking that it might have been our older sister messing with us and we went back to doing whatever it was that we were doing. After a while, we decided to head back downstairs. I turn off my lights and I come down off my bunk bed. We started heading down the hallway and I could hear my parents fighting and so I told my little sister that I'd join her down there in a minute because, to be honest, I didn't want to deal with my parents. So I went over to my older sister's bedroom, assuming she was in there because all of the lights were on from what I could see under a doorway. As I approached a door, I started to hear what sounded like a, a scrubbing noise. Honestly, the best way I could describe it is like someone was going to town on deep cleaning my bathtub. I thought it was weird since my sister literally doesn't clean anything, especially not our bathtub. I originally went to open a door and it was locked so I knocked on the door and waited and nothing. I then banged on the door thinking that she probably just couldn't hear me because of the loud noise coming from the bathroom and I shouted, Kaylin, open up. Why are you scrubbing something at like 8pm? And I again heard no reply. After a few more bangs on the door I started to get annoyed. That's when the scrubbing sound stopped thinking that she was finally coming I waited by the door when suddenly the door just started shaking as if someone on the other side was scratching at it with both hands and it was the same noise that I could hear in the bathroom. I could tell that it was shaking too because I could see the light peeking through the openings every time the door was hit. At first I assumed maybe one of the dogs got locked in there on accident but then I thought my sister was probably just messing with me so I banged on the door and yelled something like, stop messing around and let me in. The noise continued for maybe a second and that's when I banged on the door once more and suddenly everything just stopped. A few seconds of silence and there was a loud bang on the door in response. I thought at this point, okay, screw this and slowly backed away. I yelled to my mum who was downstairs and said, mum, is Kaylin in her room? And she replied, no. She's in the garage with the chickens. We had moved our chickens to the garage because it was too cold out for them and we felt our chicken coop just wasn't good enough to keep them warm. I then ran downstairs as fast as I could and asked, are you sure? And she said, I don't know, go look. So I did. I opened the door and there she was, sitting on the couch with one of our chickens. I then explained to her everything that happened and she was just as confused as me, so we decided to head up together to check it out. I told her the door was locked, so she was going to push it open. Her door kind of sucked, so with enough force she could open it, even when locked. She went to push her door open and nearly fell into the room because suddenly her door was just unlocked again. All her lights were on, the closet and the bathroom doors wide open. We kind of just stood there for a moment and wondered what the hell happened. And at that moment, we heard the scraping noise in the bathroom and we both just ran out and downstairs so fast that my sister slipped and ran into the table because my mum was mopping. So, in the end, we were not really sure what happened, but it never happened again after that. The next story, to give some backstory again, and you can believe it or not, but my sister has always been sensitive to the paranormal. Ever since she was a baby, in fact, because growing up, she'd tell my parents that she had a family friend who passed away, or she would play with our great-grandma, Jessie, who passed away when we were babies. Even as a teenager, she would tell us about figures that she would see and stuff like that. But anyway, the story goes like this. My sister comes into my room at night at about 30 minutes after I took a shower. She had come in to yell at me. All my lights were off. So she comes in, yells at me, and goes back into her room. She had heard me laughing from downstairs and yelled down the stairs for me. I replied and she asked me how long I'd been down there and I told her about 30 minutes and then asked why. She just went silent and 
said, never mind, but I knew that something was up. She didn't tell me for a few days, even though I kept pressing her about it, and eventually she told me that when she came into my room to yell at me, she saw a figure clear as day laying on my bunk bed. The figure even turned around to look at her as if it was looking over its shoulder while laying on its side. She told me that she didn't want to freak me out because I told her that sometimes when I sleep on my bed, I feel like there's something there with me on the top bunk. And after that, I had sleeping problems and it really creeped me out. I hated that room and I hated sleeping in that room and it just gave me a bad vibe every time I would go in there and so that really just turned me off from wanting to sleep in there. I 100% believe my sister too because of the fact that she was so freaked out she didn't tell me for a few days. I had a lot of things happen to me in this house and I'm really glad that I don't live there anymore. Now the next one is a little bit stupid but it was a big deal to me at the time and I think it adds to the content. So, the story starts like this. When I was around 16 or 17, I had a bedroom and in my bedroom was a dresser, my bunk bed, closet and bathroom, and I had a bunch of tacks sitting on my dresser in the plastic case that it came in. At one time, I walked into my bedroom about to head into my bathroom and the tacks were just all over the floor. I was like, damn it, who knocked this shit onto the floor again and didn't bother to pick it up? I went to my sister's room, our bedrooms were connected with the Jack and Jill bathroom, remember, and I thought that maybe she knocked it over while going into her bedroom since my dresser was right next to my bathroom. So I went in and I asked her and she said that she hadn't gone into my room all day. I was like, whatever, she's lying because I sure didn't knock it over. But a few days pass and the same thing happens again. A few days later and the same thing. I come in and the tacks are just all over my floor again. Annoyed, I pick them up and put them into a little glass box that I had so that they wouldn't fall off my dresser again. The next day I come in and my tacks are on the floor again. I was starting to get pissed off at this point because it just kept happening and I thought someone was messing with me. I asked my sister and she swore that it wasn't her. I asked my mum and my dad and neither of them knew that I even had tacks in there so... I put them back in the glass box and pushed them to the end of my dresser against the mirror. But, as you've probably ascertained by now, it just kept happening. At first it was every few days, but then it was like once a day and eventually it happened twice a day. My whole family knew about it too because I just complained about it so much. We jokingly named it the Tack Ghost and I've called it that ever since. Eventually, I kind of got used to it, so when I'd come in, I'd sort of just sigh and outwardly say, Are you kidding me? Again? Don't you have something better to do? My family kind of made fun of it and didn't really believe me too much, and I was getting pretty mad. I wanted to test something, so I put my tacks into the glass box once more, and I placed a candle on top of it. The next day, I came home from school, and guess what? Tacks are all over my bedroom floor not just in a pile in front of my dresser, and the damn candle is straight across the room with the lid off. I kind of freaked out over this, and I told everyone, and they were like, well, then take them out of the room, but I was determined to prove to them that I wasn't just making it up. So Christmas comes around, and I had a friend who was living with us at the time, and told him that we were going to test this stuff out, so he would see that I wasn't lying. After opening presents and cards, I bring all my stuff upstairs and he comes with me. I place some of the heavier items on my dresser and I put my cards and money on top of the pile. I outwardly said, don't touch my money to the ghost. And then I looked at my friend and I said, we'll come back later and see if anything happens. A few hours pass and we go upstairs to check and nothing had happened. After a little while, I honestly thought that maybe nothing was going to actually happen until my friend and I go upstairs to check and my money is across the room on the floor. Now, the air wasn't on and the windows weren't open and there just wasn't any sort of wind that could have sent them that far across my room. My friend and I screamed and ran downstairs and we told everyone and I put the tacks in a drawer on top of my dresser and after that it never happened again. So, this will be the last story because I don't want this getting too long. 
So at the time that this happened, I was living with three out of five of my sisters. It was my older sister Heather, Callan, and my younger sister Beverly. Like I said in the story above too, my family has always kind of just been in touch with the paranormal. So, my older sister Caitlin, the one who was sensitive to the paranormal as well, kept telling us that she felt that there was a ghost boy living in a closet. Well, we kind of just shrugged it off and didn't really think too much about it because it was kind of normal for us that these types of things happened. A few weird things happened around our house and in a room that we couldn't really explain, but they were all small and not worth going into detail about. But one morning, my sister woke up and we all talked about our dreams and my older sister Heather told us that she had a weird dream about an older woman coming to her and asking not to tell our parents that she was staying out of her house because she was scared or something. And that was it. That was the dream. But at the same time, my sister Kaylin kind of just looked at her, shocked, and told us that she had dreamt of a boy in her closet asking her if it was okay for her family to stay with us for a bit and asked her not to tell my parents that they were there because they didn't want to be sent away. We all were surprised and freaked out that they had the exact same dream but with different people. We told our parents who said that they sort of felt bad, that they felt scared, and that they wouldn't send them away. A long while passes and... At this time, my parents had a radio show and would interview a lot of people in the paranormal field. They would talk to psychics and things like that, and they made a lot of friends in the paranormal field. One day, my parents are in this Skype call with one of their paranormal sensitive psychic friends and ask my sister Kaylin to talk to her because she might relate to her, and long story short, this girl had told my sister about the family staying with us and told us that... They had apparently passed on when we visited a church to celebrate one of my family members being baptized. I'm not religious, but some people in my family are. And my sister started bawling her eyes out because she was so shocked that this girl knew all of this. And at this time, she sort of felt validated that a stranger was telling her, and her parents too, something that she had experienced this whole time. And my parents were just as shocked because... They hadn't even spoken about this to anyone but people within our house. So, to end the story, we never heard anything about the family again, and I hope they're doing well wherever they are, but it was a trip, let me tell you.